Maybe I should just sit in the crowd. Yasha Kayach, Tov Singer. Thank you. Thank you for coming all the way here from Yerushalayim to join us. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I mentioned Friday night in my introduction to Rav Yosef Mendelevich that I had the great schus this, this week, this year, for Tisha B'Av to do a film called Iron Faith. I want to thank Guy Orman from Big Productions, who did a tremendous job with his team putting this film together. It was not an easy project, as many tend to be. And it would give us a small synopsis as to what the Soviet, Jew, Soviet Jewish heroes did back under the communist regime to keep Torah alive in the former Soviet Union. Ladies and gentlemen, a small tidbit of our film, Iron Faith. With the rise of communism, they essentially were looking to obliterate everything that was Jewish. Schools, yeshivas, synagogues, shkita, mikveh, you name it. My father told me about some of his experiences. He said, we live 24 hours in fear. You can imagine that you go to sleep in fear, you wake up in fear, they can knock on your door anytime, arrest anyone. These people who were born after the communists took over, they knew nothing. Religion was, a, was forbidden. There was no such thing. It was being drummed out of them. Nobody told me that there is a God. I discovered myself. After the Six Day War, Jewish identity in the Soviet Union skyrocketed. It created a renaissance of Jewish life in a country that was atheistic and that prohibited religion. Me and some other friends decided to establish an underground Jewish educational movement to prevent assimilation. I asked my friends and acquaintances, do you want to learn Torah? They said, so what is Torah? I do want to know Torah, but what is Torah? I said, Torah is our life. So the first students were 15 young people. The network of our studying was about 20 cities in the Soviet Union under the eyes of KGB. I want to stress, it's not so easy, under the eyes of KGB. It was a real struggle, a small group of people against a massive empire. If a regular Jewish citizen in Soviet Russia would discover that we are doing that, they would tell, don't they understand? KGB is, knows everything. Why they are not afraid? Hanukkah class of 1980, about 30, 40 people were sitting in the room. One of my friends was sitting right near me when the bell rang. So he came to open the door and there was a big bang, like he was like flew to the opposite wall. And a second later, we saw police storming the room. Don't move, hands on the table, you're under arrest. It was a scary moment. I remember how my soul sinked somewhere. I uh, came to understand that uh, educating uh, hundreds and maybe thousands will not solve the problem of a complete uh, assimilation. So it was obvious uh, to me that the only possible way is to break out, to get out from Soviet Russia and to open the gates for freedom of immigration, even illegally. So in Riga, in fact, a certain man called Hill Butman, Olova Sholom, uh, come up with the idea to hijack a Russian airplane and try to escape. When we arrested red-handed in the airport, we were being sentenced uh, for 15 years of imprisonment of betraying Russian motherland in Siberia. The person who sent me was someone named Ernie Hirsch. He himself had been there, he was tossed out, and he chanced upon a group of people sitting and learning, and that was SS. He was dazzled. And he came back to the shul and he gave a clap. But he said, there are people, Shamatari Mitzvahs in Russia, who need our help. We must help them. The Israeli government sent in month by month two people to maintain contact with Jews there. In a nondescript building, we were given our instructions. We're going to Moscow, Leningrad, and Kiev. We were basically going to teach Torah. As soon as I walk out of the taxi, 
I have two people grab my arms and they push me into another car. I said, where are you taking me? He turned around and he said to me, do you think your God is going to help you now? And I said, I most definitely do. One major problem was I had in my pocket booklets about Twill, about Tzitzis, about Shabbos, about this. I was pulling out these pamphlets and burying in between the seats. I must have thrown in about 20 pamphlets. Friday, we come to a train station near where we're going to spend Shabbos. As we get out, we see from other doors young people, many of them wearing kippot, and we're all walking in the same direction. Davening Minchen Kabbalah Shabbos was done by the whole group, word by word, you understand? L'chu, n'ranano. Everybody davened together. It was a, a scene, unbelievable. And then they started singing. Yerushalayim. And I see these young people, their tears, they're crying. These kids in Moscow that Friday night, that was their lifelong yearning. That was a, an experience unmatched. Young people, young people. These are people that we can be in awe of. These are people who saw the fire, stood before the abyss, and stood strong. This represents the best of what Jews are. Nations keep coming, nations keep going, passing like shadows wiped off the earth. Egypt enslaved thee, Babylon crushed thee, Rome led thee captive. Where are those nations mighty and fearsome? We were present in the world at the birth of all the great empires, and we were also the one who said the Hespid at the Levaya. So Iron Curtain, I think, was coined by Churchill. An Iron Curtain has descended across the continent. Behind that line... But the Talmud says, a filum achitza shel barzel, means an iron curtain cannot separate the Jewish people from God. I'm learning so much faith, and I learn how to believe in people from my students. They really inspire me. And the need to reach out to those that otherwise will fade away need to be conveyed again and again. People who sacrifice their lives, sacrifice their comfort, and they do so much to bring other Jews back to their Yiddishkeit. And if this feeling of pain and responsibility and commitment will be conveyed and become the spirit of the generation, we have so much hope and we can do so much together because together we can overcome anything. After being arrested in the airport, they brought us uh, to a KGB prison for interrogation. And it uh, became very soon obvious to me that their scheme was to arrest us red-handed. Also, they did know about our preparation for a lot of time. They would like to arrest us red-handed and then make us cooperate with them, call up a war jury to stop any activities and because of us. And then we had to call up a Russian jury, sit back and get assimilated. So they tried different ways to break my will, torture me, intimidate, but it wouldn't help. So I say they known uh, way of uh, deal with people, stick and carrot. Their stick got broken, so you used a carrot. By the way, I don't uh, like carrots. Anyway, <laughs> what uh, their carrot was, after all uh, the interrogations, I was escorted to another Russian officer and he was very soft. He told me, Yosef, I am sorry that you arrested. You know, if he is sorry, why should he arrest me? Anyway, I am sorry that you arrested. 
It is their carrot. Uh, and I can understand you. You are a young man, romantic, dreams. But now, he told me, believe me, I am like your old brother. Recommend you. Don't be stubborn. You will not break the wall with your head. You will break your head. So be clever, cooperate, and you will get less penalty. Instead of death penalty, maybe only seven years of imprisonment. And then he looked at me and he told me, you say you are Jewish, you belong to a Jewish nation, you work for a Jewish nation, you don't look Jewish at all. You know? He told me, you're like our Russian brother. You studied in Russian high school, in Russian university. You know a lot of uh, Russian poetry. You are Russian. What? All of a sudden you start thinking that you are Jewish. You know, it was obviously a way to uh, find a way to my heart. But um, when the interrogators only yell at you, intimidate, and torture you, all of a sudden you find somebody that speaks, talks to you in a human way. And he felt that like something is happening with me. Okay, he told uh, the guard, take him back into his cell, let him, let him think again. So I was there in the cell, and I told to myself, maybe he is right. Maybe it is not the time for dreams. I have to be realistic to save my life. And then I recollected what he told me. You don't look Jewish. You are not Jewish. With what you are Jewish? You got our Russian education. What's Jewish in you? And I got angry. How he dare to tell me that I am not Jewish? And I thought about myself, really? How am you Jewish? I look like them, speak their language, behave like them. What makes me different? If I would behave as a Jew, he could understand that I am different. What does it mean to behave as a Jew to keep mitzvahs? So, uh, being in the underground Jewish educational movement, I would go from time to time to the shul, to the synagogue. I did know something, but uh, now I felt it is not enough. I have to make the decision to behave Jewish, mitzvahs. It's good to say to be in the empty room, in the cell, Keep mitzvahs. In what way? I don't know anything. I have to behave a Jew, as a Jew. And I decided I'll build a wall between me and him. Behaving differently, not the, like them. For declaration is not enough. Say, I am Jewish. It's not enough. You have to behave to do something Jewish. So I invented a way to be Jewish. In fact, I covered my head. And I had a black beret, but thrown in the ground in the airport, I lost uh, the beret. Baruch Hashem, not the, my head, only the beret. So I, I need something to cover my head, a yarmulke. They would laugh at me if I, I would ask for a yarmulke. So I invented my yarmulke. I got, it was legally to have a handkerchief. So I made knots on my handkerchief like this. I will not take your time. I, I made four angles. Now it will be only two of them. And uh, then export it next time to uh, the officer. <laughs> it, you know, one of the ways to break me, they previously sent me to a mental institution telling that if I, they told, if you wouldn't cooperate, we will admit that you are crazy and you will stay in uh, this mental institution for a life. So, they had to release me. Now the officer looked at me and he told me, Yosef, you are completely crazy. He told me, why not by chance they put me, you in uh, the mental institution? Behave, you are an educated man. Why would you put this piece of cloth on your head? I told, yes, I am an educa educated man. But I have a Jewish education. And according to our Jewish education, we have to cover our head. So I told him a whole story about Moshe Rabbeinu, Yitzhak Mitzrayim, etc., etc. I believe it was the first 
times that he wrote down my report, for I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't cooperate with them. And then he became angry and told him, you think you are smart? You are stupid. For it is the way you are digging your grave. Think again. It doesn't pay you to behave this way and think, send me back to, to my cell. When back in my cell, I told, okay, I am on the right way. The enemy is angry with you. With ang with the enemy is pleased with you, is, you have a problem. When the enemy is angry with you, I am doing the right thing. I have to build another layer of, of my wall. What can I invent? And I decided I will double. I didn't remember, certainly, Shmona Esrei, but I was an underground Hebrew teacher, so I wrote uh, my prayer saying, take care of my nation, I'm Israel, take them from uh, Russian slavery, take care on uh, my family, my father, my sisters, and don't forget me here in uh, the prison. I can't withstand anymore. Now I had to find Mizrach. I was aware that we have to daven to the direction of Mizrach. What to do? And I recollected that in underground we had the Sefer Daniel, telling about Daniel, the prophet, that was in my situation some 2,500 years before. He had to find out where is, uh, uh, where is uh, Yerushalayim. He just opened the wall, uh, the, the, uh, uh, opened the window and directed his heart davening to Yerushalayim. And it's in, now I checked, it's in Shulchan Oroch. If you don't have a smartphone and if you don't, the direction of Yerushalayim, it just open the window and what's the, what is important to direct your, your heart. So I couldn't uh, certainly open the, wall, uh, the, the window. There was a lot of great of it, but at least I stood at the window and I had my piece of my prayer. We say, as when we daven, we have imagined that we are down there and crying out, makim karasi Hashem. In my situation, I even wouldn't need, I didn't need to imagine. It was real. I was there, deb, deb, in a Russian prison. I would cry out, Anna Hashem, Oshiana. After a while, after this kind of practice, the door got opened. The guards entered, rushed inside, grabbed me in the wall, and told me, we watch you all the time, you stand at the wall and you, uh, uh, you, you touch the wall, what you try to take out a brick to run away. They, can't, they, ch they check the wall and the grates, nothing, everything is in tech. So they check my pocket and they found um, uh, my, my, my tefillah. They said, what is that? Ah, we understand, it is a secret letter that you try to pass over to your friends, you know, you should be really crazy to imagine that you can pass something without envelope, without an ad address, through a, a locked window with a lot of grace. But they had no explanation, so they take it away, took it away, and after uh, several days I was escorted back to the office of this, my Russian brother. I saw on the uh, top of um, his table my, my file, and in the translation, he was very angry. He told me, Yosef, what's happening with you? I got the translation, it is a tefillah. You are davening. You became religious. You've never been religious. You got our communist education. Who influenced you? I told, it's uh, God. Everyone should influenced me. You know, but he wouldn't believe. Imagine what happened. I had, in fact, two options, to cooperate or not to cooperate with the, with the interrogation, with, with KGB. I had no third option. Yes, I had. The third option, the third way was just to link, to follow Rebbeinu Shaloylam. And as far as this third decision was completely illogical, I know that it was Rebbeinu Shaloylam himself that ordered me and I am privileged that I accepted his order and followed him. How I know, how I know that it was the only one true way, for a simple reason, for I'm here with my wife, 
with my children, grandchildren. It's a victory. When, uh, when uh, in the court, during the trial, the uh, judge asked me, Mendelevich, why would you betray your motherland? I told you know what? Ribbon Shaloilim give Abraham, Isaac, and Yaakov Eretz Israel. It's my motherland. I am their grandchild. So I never betrayed, and I believe I will never betray my real motherland. So the prosecutor stood up and told the judge, Don't you know Mendelevich is a fanatic religious Jew? You know, he told, We cannot understand how the man being educated in our university studying thermodynamics, physics, etc., etc., et is devoted, devoted only to his God. You know, fanatic. So I'm, I, I'm not fanatic, but I am proud when my enemy admits that he cannot win me, for I am a religious fanatic Jew. And then, <laughs> and then I spent, as I told, 11 years in the prison, and when I was out, sent away from Soviet Russia, they canceled, they wouldn't pardon me. They told, we don't pardon you. You don't deserve pardon. We cancel, we cancel your Russian citizenship for you don't deserve to be a Russian citizen. And I, that day I was aware that already 200,000 Jews left Soviet Russia after we were arrested. It means when I was there in the prison, I told Rivon Shaloilam, I know that people start immigrating, leaving Russia. If so, I am ready to stay as much as needed in the prison. Just let them go. And it's like my pigeon of Shvuim. You imagine you to release 200,000 Jews to make a pigeon Shvuim for 200,000 Jews, you have to be a millionaire. I'm the millionaire. What I'm saying now, you used to demonstrate, and I met here a lot of people that told they demonstrate and did all kinds of efforts to save Russian Jew. It was the slogan, save Russian Jew now. Now I come here to tell you something different. Save American Jew now, save them. Rabbi Mendelevich, we hope to take your message home tonight and to do just a fraction of what you were able to accomplish to free 200,000 Jews. May it be his will that all of us in this room could bring back 200,000 Jews. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, tonight, this is the highlight for me for tonight. Everyone here knows by now that Project Inspire has a one-on-one -on -one learning program. And of course, you'll get your opportunity momentarily to sign up. But during the pandemic, many programs were run through Project Inspire with the sole focus of getting people to learn one-on-one. -on -one. Isn't that right, Stuart? One-on-one -on -one learning. And so using the Shabbat show and using the many online projects that we ran throughout the pandemic, we pushed everyone to sign up to learn one-on-one. -on -one. And one such person flew in to be here with us tonight. He is a beneficiary of our program, of our one-on-one -on -one learning program, and a be beneficiary of people very similar to you in this room. So, especially in from Minneapolis, Minnesota, I'd like to ask Dr. Luciano Kaladny to share his experience with us today.